Hello, welcome to ChemBio and to A-Level Biology Revision. This video concerns the last part of this nucleic acid section of the Biological Molecules chapter, which is about protein synthesis. Stay tuned. So we've seen already how DNA replicates, and this process of replication is important during cell division, so that we can transfer genetic information. Now the other role of DNA is to contain the instructions for the synthesis of proteins, and that's exactly what we're going to look at today. First of all, let's just familiarise ourselves with a few key terms. The genetic code is exactly what has just been described. It refers to the fact that DNA is involved in the synthesis of proteins, by coding for a specific sequence of amino acids. Now, just like code on a computer gives the instructions for a certain program, likewise DNA codes for the production of proteins. Similar sort of idea. Now, if you remember on from earlier in the topic, proteins are polypeptide chains folded into tertiary or quaternary structures. And the polypeptide chains are pretty much long sequences of amino acids. And this sequence of amino acids is unique to every protein. It is very important in which order all these amino acids are repeated. And this order is determined by information that is in the DNA, in the form of all the bases. Triplet codes means that three bases form a triplet codon. So a codon is these three bases. So if you can imagine if we're looking at a DNA molecule, we have all the bases on one strand, A, T, C, G, C, G, T, C, and so on and so on. Well, three of those together form a codon. And the information on the DNA is read in sets of three in these codons. So let's say we have A, T, C, well, that's one codon. Next codon, C, G, A, for example, I'm just giving you these randomly, that will be another codon. And it's read along down in these codons and each codon corresponds to one amino acid. So you can now kind of imagine that this sequence of codons is the same as the sequence of the amino acids because one codon equals one amino acid. That is how the order is determined. So once again, a triplet codon is three bases, and that is what we refer to as triplet code. That's the general idea of it. Now we have an interesting nuance here. There are 20 amino acids, but there are 64 possible combinations of the codons. If you do the maths, you can confirm that, well, we have four bases A, T, C, G, and three bases in one codon. So four to the power three is 64, but we only have 20 amino acids. What happens here? Well, this is where degenerate code comes in. And this means that several codons can code for the same amino acid. Or we can state the reverse argument and say that, well, one amino acid can be coded for using many codons. Now, a key point, a section of DNA that codes for one protein is called a gene. So if you can imagine, a gene is one section of the DNA that contains all these codons, yes? If, let's say, the protein is formed of 500 amino acids, well, therefore, a gene will have 500 codons because each codon is one amino acid. That section of DNA that contains these 500 codons, well, 1,500 bases, if you like, that is one gene. It's important to know as well that the genetic code is non-overlapping. That means that these genes are read one at a time. All the codons and everything is read one at a time. Nothing overlaps each other. It also contains start and stop codons, which signal the start or the end of an amino acid sequence, so that we know that, right, okay, this is where a new protein starts. That's it. We've read all the information. We know now how to form the protein. We know all the amino acids and their order. Stop codon. Right, that's it. Protein done. Next one. And then next one and so on. So it's quite a clever mechanism, actually. Right, now we're ready to talk about protein synthesis. However, I'd like to start off by giving you a bit of an analogy for it so that it may be a bit easier for you to understand and then I'll be able to refer back to this analogy every now and again throughout the video. So, a bit of story time. Imagine a large factory and this factory produces confectionery goods, so sweets, and it produces a very wide variety of sweets. It's just absolutely overwhelming, so many different sweets this factory can produce. 
In the middle of this factory is a room, and in the middle of that room is a very large recipe book that contains all the recipes for all the different sweets that the factory can produce. Dotted around the factory outside the room, of course, are all the conveyor belts, and those are the sites where the sweets are obviously produced. And all the raw materials come to these conveyor belts so that the sweet can be produced. Now we have one problem. This recipe book that is in that room, remember, in the middle of the factory, it's so large that it can't even fit through the doors of this room. And anyway, it would be quite impractical to carry around this very large book each time we need to produce a sweet. And just for information, these sweets are being produced simultaneously at the same, at the same time in very large volumes. So the solution is, workers of this factory come along to this room with their notepads, they find the correct page in the recipe book for the production of one sweet, and they quite simply rewrite the recipe in their notepad. They act as a photocopier pretty much, and they just copy down the recipe. They then tear off that sheet of paper, they tear off that page in their notebook, throw it out of the room, and let's just say in this factory, magically, this piece of paper ends up um, at the correct conveyor belt. And then the conveyor belt reads the recipe and the sweet is produced. There we go, that's the end of the story. So let's see how we can apply this now to real protein synthesis. I hope that first of all you've managed to gather that this factory is a cell, the room in the middle is the nucleus, the large recipe book is the DNA, and all the conveyor belts are the sites of protein synthesis, and we know from GCSE that those are the ribosomes. I also hope that you've managed to gather the key idea of that piece of paper that the workers wrote on. It kind of serves as a bit of a messenger, as a bit of a bridge between the room, the recipe book in that room, and the conveyor belts. And this is a key point in protein synthesis, and you'll see why in just a few moments. So, protein synthesis starts in the nucleus, and we actually split the whole process of protein synthesis into two stages. One is called transcription, that's what takes place in the nucleus, and the other is translation, that's what takes place on the ribosomes. So, let's just imagine that we're in the nucleus here. This is our DNA. Remember that DNA has all the information necessary for the production of the proteins. And presented on this diagram, let's just say, is a gene. So, all the information here, that's for the production of one protein. So just like with DNA replication, the double helix needs to unwind so that the strands become exposed. And the catalysis of this is done with the aid of the enzyme DNA helicase, just like with DNA replication once again. So with DNA replication, both of the strands are exposed and they're both template strands. With protein synthesis, only the bottom one is going to act as a template strand. We also refer to it as the sense strand. So when we talk about protein synthesis, we say that the template strand is the sense strand, okay? And therefore the opposite strand, which is complementary, remember, will be the anti-sense strand. So it will contain the opposite bases to the template strand via complementary base pairing. Now this time what's different is that it's RNA nucleotides from the nucleus that come and line up, not DNA nucleotides. Because that sheet of paper that contained the recipe that was copied from the recipe book is actually mRNA in protein synthesis. Remember I mentioned in the nucleic acids video that RNA has variants and mRNA is one of them. It actually stands for messenger RNA and that's exactly what its function is. It's to basically copy the information in the, in the DNA and then transfer it to the ribosomes and that's exactly what's done. It just happens to be that RNA is used rather than DNA. The only difference from the um, antisense strand, because if you think about it, all the nucleotides on the mRNA molecule will be exactly the same as the antisense strand, apart from the fact that thymine will be replaced by uracil. That is the only difference. We can say, therefore, that the antisense strand is the one that codes for the protein. The sense strand, the template, actually doesn't code for the protein. So now what happens is a different enzyme, and this enzyme we can say is that worker, that factory worker that comes along and rewrites the recipe, we can say it's an enzyme. It now needs to catalyze the formation of the phosphodiester bond so that we have one whole molecule. This time, however, it's not DNA polymerase, but yes, you're right, RNA polymerase, because we have RNA nucleotides. So here is our nuclear membrane. Here are our nuclear pores, and the mRNA leaves the nucleus. Now, actually, there are a few other stages that happen before mRNA is ready to leave the nucleus. 
as you know already, DNA is, well, first of all, too large to leave the nucleus, but secondly, we don't want it to get damaged in the cytosol. Surely then, if mRNA leaves the nucleus, it will also get damaged. Yes, you're right, and that's why we need to add on some protective material, inverted commas, to the ends of the mRNA. We also need to apply a few other changes to the sequences of the uh, bases in the mRNA molecule. We need to remove some and then rearrange them in some way. That is a process called splicing. Now, all of this I've just described, we don't need to know for A-level biology. It's beyond the spec, but if you are interested, I definitely recommend you research it. But otherwise, we need to know that the mRNA molecule has been produced. Now it's ready to leave the nucleus via the nuclear pores. After the mRNA molecule has left the nucleus, the gene then rewinds to its original shape. So we've seen the process of transcription. Let's now summarize it. So it takes place in the nucleus. The necessary gene, so the one that codes for the protein that we want to produce, is identified and transcribed into mRNA using RNA nucleotides in the nucleus. We start off by unwinding the gene, just like in DNA replication. The hydrogen bonds are broken. Oh, and yes, this is catalyzed by DNA helicase. And then the two strands are exposed, but we're only interested in the template strand at the moment. Free RNA nucleotides in the nucleus come along to those exposed bases. Using complementary base pairing, they then line up to them. Then the enzyme RNA polymerase catalyzes the formation of the phosphodiester bonds on that mRNA molecule. Our mRNA molecule is now ready to leave the nucleus. It does so via the nuclear pores. The gene then rewinds. Right, so that was the first stage of transcription. Now let's move on to the conveyor belts in the factory for translation. So here was our nucleus. Now let's move to somewhere else in the cell. Here we go. This is our organelle, a very, very basic diagram of a ribosome. Remember that it has a small subunit and a large subunit. Well, the mRNA comes and attaches to the small subunit, and now we're ready to carry out translation. Now, a very specific other variant of RNA called tRNA, which is short for transfer RNA, is involved in translation. tRNA molecules have a very specific structure. At the bottom of them, they have something called an anticodon. Well, if you remember what a codon is, well, it's three bases that code for one amino acid. Well, the anticodon will just be the complementary basis to the codon. In other words, if you think about it, the anticodon contains the same three bases as the bases on the sense strand. Because remember, the sense strand was then um, lined up by with RNA nucleotides. Those RNA nucleotides are the same as the antisense strand, or therefore the anti or the opposite to the antisense strand will be back the template strand. It's quite confusing, but if you visualize it, maybe that will help. Um, Apart from the fact, obviously, that RNA nucleotides will have uracil instead of thymine. Anyway, what happens now is the ribosome moves along this mRNA, and the main role of the ribosome is just to aid this assembly of the protein. It, it's the place where tRNA and mRNA join. So it moves along from left to right. Then, here we go, these are these tRNA molecules. There we go, you can see at the bottom is the anticodon. Notice that it's complementary to the codon and at the top, an amino acid is attached. It releases the amino acid and moves down. The next one comes along, releases the amino acid, moves away. Next one comes along, drops off the amino acid, disappears. And there we go, that's our amino acid chain formed. Now, of course, in reality, proteins don't just have three amino acids. It's a much longer polypeptide chain. So obviously, translation would take place for a longer period of time. But you get the idea. Now the peptide bonds are ready to form between the amino acids. And there we go. There's our polypeptide chain. And then what happens? Vesicles transport this polypeptide to the Golgi apparatus, where any other conformational changes are made to produce maybe a, to form maybe a tertiary structure or even a quaternary structure. And then, if necessary, the protein leaves the cell via exocytosis. So now let's summarize translation. So, translation then. It takes place in ribosomes. First of all, the mRNA binds to the smallest subunit on the ribosome. Then the ribosome moves along the mRNA and catalyzes pretty much the polypeptide assembly. Then we have these tRNA molecules, and they carry the amino acids. So each tRNA molecule is different. It will have a very own unique amino acid 
that is coded for by the codon on the mRNA molecule. So if you think about it this way, since, there are, since it has a specific amino acid, there are 64 possible tRNA molecules. Then the peptide bonds form between the amino acids, and this is catalyzed by an enzyme called peptidyl transferase. And finally, when the ribosome reaches a stop codon on the mRNA, we know that that's it. This is the end of the polypeptide. We know that it's now ready to form a protein. We then release it. Okay, so that is it for protein synthesis. That's everything that we need to know for A-level. If you have any questions, please ask in the comments. I have a feeling that there might be some confusion that will arise, maybe not. Um, otherwise, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for liking and subscribing. See you next time. Goodbye.